My name is Martin Fröhlich, and this presentation is obviously about EV, but I will give you a bit of an expose of how this, this project actually came about and how I actually came about to, to work on this project. But first I would like to make some stats. I would like to know about my spectators. Uh, how many of you are working in the VFX industry and uh, are familiar with green screen VFX? Uh, how many of you uh, play around with game engines? How many of you combine that? <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, okay, I will quickly give you an introduction about me and the institution I'm representing here, and then uh, I show you some of the recorded, and uh, I show you the setup we used, and then some recorded footage, and then about the future that we'll maybe come. Now, about more than half a lifetime ago, I got myself a degree in mechanical engineering, and it was a time when uh, nobody uh, could afford CAD systems, so I was not able to learn a CAD system at the time. So I didn't uh, learn any CAD, and uh, when 2009 the first 3D printers came about, I had to and I wanted to do some 3D printing, I looked for a tool and uh, it was Blender that uh, I chose. And after my studies as a mechanical engineer, uh, I was working for about 10 years as a software uh, developer and then I got myself another degree as a media artist. And ever since then, I've been meandering between the two fields of technology and arts and uh, a, a combination that I would call an inventor of things humanity hasn't been asking for. <laughs> <laughs> now you wonder what might have been those inventions and I'm happy to show you one of them. This is the impersonating overhead display. Uh, obviously a device that will never make it to the market. Uh, then there is the moss printer. It's a water spray apparatus that uh, sprays water onto house walls and you wonder is this actually working, is actually moss growing because this is a process obviously that's going to take many months until maybe something starts to happen. Unfortunately it turned out to be harder than I thought to find a house owner to test me wrong. <laughs> and the the last project here, this is uh, a mechanical contraption between time and space. And it is actually a mechanical contraption that uh, is pulling white rubber bands into the shape of a rotating sphere. And you might, it is running, yes. And you might guess it, actually I designed this with Blender with lots of drivers uh, in the background. Uh, the, the piece is actually open source, this is, it's actually a uh, Creative Commons. Uh, you can find it on my website, download it, uh, laser cut it and build it yourself. But the, the topic that actually brought me finally to this stage was spatial augmented reality. Is anybody familiar with this term, spatial augmented reality? We see two hands, three hands, four hands. Spatial augmented reality is the little step brother of augmented reality and uh, the difference between those two is uh, with augmented reality you hold a handheld device in your hand uh, and and work with that one. Spatial augmented reality or projected augmented reality uh, is, is using projectors to project the virtual image onto the real object. Now for a setup like this, it's quite elaborate. Uh, you need uh, two tracking systems, an infrared tracking system to track the object in the sub-millimeter precision. Then you need a 3D camera to track the observer. You need two or three projectors that have to be calibrated. Then you have to be able to uh, render the image you want to project onto the real object from the point of view of the observer. Then you virtually project uh, this, this, this texture onto the virtual representation of the object you want to project it on, record it from the point of view of the projectors and then throw it back onto the real object in order to get this effect. And it is a bit mind-bending and because it's so mind-bending and complex, I actually had to write my own software 
allowed me to get through all those different transformations and shaders and whatever in order to make the whole thing real time. And I didn't even, uh, even mention now, it needs actually real time soft edge blending. So I have to, for each frame, figure out which pixel uh, has to be projected by which projector in order to get not a ugly seam on the object. So now, this, this, uh, this tool I developed actually for the purpose of museums and, and fair trades. But uh, through some circumstances, I had more contacts with, with, uh, with, with performing arts. So actually, all the, all, all my most, of, uh, most of the applications I, I uh, got into public with it uh, was in theaters or dance uh, productions. Now in here, I'd quickly make you or give you a, make a little advertisement for my software. It's called Spark, with CK at the end. Uh, it's an acronym for Spatial Augmented Reality Construction Kit. And I'm going to actually publish it uh, open source very soon. Um, if any of you have experience with licenses and would like to um, give some advice, I'm very open for it most likely it's going to be an MIT. Now, this software and this, these applications in the dancing and, and performing arts actually gotten me a job at the immersive art space. And what we're going to see here, it's a very short video, is a animation made in Unity uh, of a virtual character designed by Tobias Kremler. Uh, we used a live motion capture suit the screen is captured as well, so we know the position of the screen. Uh, we also animate the, the virtual camera inside Unity with the position of the screen, and Spark is used to project the whole thing back onto the object. Now, the nice, the nice thing about this installation was that the, um, the stage designer came up with a, a nice idea for the screen, so she's used these, these rubber bands uh, which allowed the dancers to actually step through the screen and this way kind of um, created a portal where the dancers could step between the reality and the virtuality. Now I mentioned the immersive art space. The immersive art space is actually a huge space, uh, 360 square meters and uh, we have a a large volume mocap system, obviously. We've got a 3D audio system. We've got a large uh, venue projectors for this kind of purposes. But it's not just a space. We're also in a research group, and we research into multi-user VR experiences, photogrammetry, performance capture, spatial augmented reality, virtual production, and low-cost tracking technologies. The immersive art space uh, is located inside the University of the Arts, which is one monolithic block, uh, and it hosts about 2,100 students uh, that study design, film, fine arts, music, dance, theater, transdisciplinary, and art education. Now, one of the promises when the, the university actually moved into this huge uh, campus was that more transdisciplinary work or uh, projects could uh, start to happen. And uh, a pilot project before the immersive art space showed that using technology as a neutral um, facilitator could actually help uh, achieving that because all these different disciplines, they, they talk a different language, they have a different uh, creative culture and discourses, which is tricky in order to uh, find a common ground. Now let's get to the meat. Uh, virtual real aesthetics and the perception of virtual spaces in film. This is a Swiss National Science Fund funded uh, project and the basic idea is fairly simple. Uh, we created two short movies, um, each of them about five or six minutes, and each of them in two different versions. One on relocation and one in front of green screen. Uh, the idea behind that was that we want to use these movies now in the uh, context of a psychological study to see uh, how virtual spaces, in this case, these this virtual created uh, uh, movies, 
how the perception of those influenced the, um, uh, influenced the spectator. Now, green screenshots are notoriously expensive, and usually we don't use them in the Swiss, uh, in the Swiss industry, in the Swiss film industry. Um, we, are tr or we try to avoid them because our budgets usually don't allow this, and the, the, the wages uh, actually are so high that we, our, our studios, they cannot compete with, or cannot really compete with the FX studios that are around us in Europe. But uh, there are still some use cases uh, where we can't have a shot of a movie uh, on location where we might have to need to scan things. And based on this premise, we decided we, we go through this and we could actually learn about photogrammetric uh, capturing, uh, previsualization table, virtual production, and the post-production thing. And uh, just a quick overview of the of a process that uh, we have. So we have a storyboard, loca location scouting, we have a photogrammetry or scan, modeling previsualization, and then it goes to the shooting, and here we have two shots, one on location and on one on green screen. And I wish I could uh, tell you here that uh, in any of those steps, Blender was used. Unfortunately, this is not the case. Uh, otherwise, my title probably would have looked, uh, would have uh, be a different one. But there was this part of virtual production, and the virtual production happens during the green, sh green screen shot, and when I learned about uh, what they were planning to do, and that was about a year ago, and EV just came out with uh, 2.80 beta, I thought this is maybe the chance to bring uh, Blender into the game. So what do we have to achieve? We actually have to do the whole post-processing part in real time, so video tracking, keying, uh, background rendering and compositing. And so how does the setup look like? So we've got a green screen, we've got a camera, we've got actors, and we've got a moving camera. And one thing that uh, is, is uh, important to see now, once you're looking at the, at the scene from the angle from a director or a cameraman, obviously this, these actors, they stand in the void. And this is very, very disorienting. So what is this uh, virtual production or this real screen, uh, real time screen uh, s background uh, plating uh, would help is to help the cameraman to uh, understand where actually the actors are moving, where, where this, what's happening. The director can actually give some sensible directions to the, the, uh, the, uh, the actors and the lightning guys uh, have an idea how the whole composition might look like so, so that the lightning of the foreground and the background actually they fit. So we would need something like this. And in order to achieve that, we need a mocap system. And our mo uh, is anybody familiar with mocap systems in here? Uh, how many of you, maybe five or six hands, how many of you have direct access to a mocap system, a large volume mocap system? There's one person, two person, kind of three, a little bit. So it's not very widely uh, available and they're actually quite expensive. Uh, just to give you a quick idea how a mocap system works, so each camera is actually sending an infrared, uh, um, infrared signal out from the camera. Uh, there is a reflector that reflects this back onto uh, the camera. We see this on the right hand side. These are the little white points. And uh, each of these points actually represent an, a view ray, and if two view rays uh, are intersect in the space, then the system thinks this is a marker. And in order to do what we wanted to do, we actually had to track the camera, and we did that through a so-called rigid body. So we see on the top of the camera, we see a rigid body with four markers. And here in the tracking system, we see how it looks like. We see on the top of the camera, the, the four markers. Uh, this, this rigid body has actually pivot point, and we need to be able to place the pivot point into the axis of the lens. And that's what the other three markers are for, so this way I can actually uh, locate the, 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 the lens axis and orientate, orient it uh, accordingly. Uh, short words about the pipeline we use. So we have a camera that sends an SDI signal to a colleague here. We used here a, a TV grade, real-time hardware to do this. Uh, we've got obviously a tracking system. And the way, we, the, the way I got 
the tracking data into Blender was via open sound control. Is anybody familiar with open sound control? So we've got uh, five or six hands. It's not a very common um, protocol uh, in this field here, but uh, when you do interactive installations, it's actually a very nice uh, protocol. You can very quickly uh, design your own on, on data structure and send it forth and back. And there was actually an add-on for uh, Blender, but it was for 2.79, so I had to port it for 2.80. So uh, this way I got the camera data or the camera position into Blender, sent the sent information via HDMI to uh, STI, um, HDMI to STI, and then composed the whole thing inside of the color here. Now, short words about the way we uh, created the models. As, as I said, we, we actually went on site and uh, laser scanned uh, the, 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 the site. There's no fancy science fiction uh, background plates I'm going to show you here, but actually rather uh, simple um, uh, places, living places. Uh, what we used, we actually used laser scan and then used uh, pictures, uh, photos we wanted to use for photogrammetry and projected them back onto uh, the, uh, the model. And oh, I have to actually look it from here. Now, as you can see, it, it represents itself as a, as a box. This is a, 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 the model of a flat. Um, and the tricky thing here is actually the navigation inside of this box. You always drop out of the box, which is a bit of pain. And lucky for me that uh, Blender has this uh, nice little nifty feature, um, which you can access with Alt-B. And Alt-B allows you to actually crop uh, the object in such a way that it's not affecting the final render. So in this viewport, actually, I, I could crop away the, the ceiling and I had a nice overview. Here you see some of the details of the scan. It's actually not very detailed. The details is more in the texture. But uh, it was actually quite a cheap model. The, the model uh, I got here was actually just ready uh, one day before we got onto the set. So I had to a little, little bit improvise here with uh, all the lighting and so on. We see the camera is already moving, so it already gets the data. So I have a quick look at uh, the OSC plugin. We see here, this is the IP address, the local IP address. Uh, we have the port on which uh, Blender is listening to, and here we have the OSC messages that are being passed on to a, a little empty that uh, is receiving all the, the transformation data. So I'm sending here position and quaternion. I have to switch here the W value or Blender wants to have it first. Uh, here we see the live data that's coming in uh, on, the, on the empty. And then on the camera dolly, we see here I actually used some drivers that was in case I had to scale the data that was coming in from the motion capture system. And, and then on the camera level, uh, I uh, only had to make some small, uh, some small little color corrections on the, on the rotations. Here on the y-axis, I could have made some corrections on the nodal point. Actually, the, the pivot inside the motif should be actually inside uh, at the, the nodal point of the, the lens, but I didn't go into these details. Uh, in terms of lighting, um, nothing special. I used EV, uh, fairly high exposure, in order to lighten up the thing because the texture well obviously already had the, the lightning baked in. It was uh, kind of unavoidable. But I, I added, see, I've got some ambient occlusion, um, and I did some, some curves, but that was basically it. And inside the scene, there are two light uh, rectangles, um, and that was basically it. So I just lightened up the, uh, the scene a little bit from the point of view of the, the, the window. OK. Now, this is the scene itself, it's the same room, uh, but now here, um, live. Now, we, uh, as I mentioned, this is not a Michael Bay movie. The, the camera movements were quite subtle most of the time. Um, you see here the, the motion capture system uh, actually had a little bit of noise. That's why the background is a little bit shaky. And uh, that was uh, right at the beginning of the shooting um, when I haven't realized yet that there was actually something like a uh, focal, uh, focal setting where I could uh, 
blur the background a little bit. You can see now the, the girl in the background is actually blurrier than the background itself. Um, I, I certainly could have corrected that. Uh, in later shots, I actually did that. So it was for me, it was really learning, learning by doing. It was jump, just jump, jumping into, into cold water here. Um, and the noise we had here with the motion capture system is this is the same scene here from a different angle. Um, as you can see, um, movie studios are not really the ideal location for motion capture uh, systems because you have lots of uh, lamps that uh, irradiate infrared. You have uh, shiny fixtures that are reflecting as well, which uh, create fake markers. So that's why you get this light, um, this light uh, noise in the tracking. But then again, we didn't want to have a final product here. We only wanted to have a reference that uh, would be helpful. Um, so this little noise and this, this, uh, these, little, these little jerks, they, they really didn't, didn't matter that much. This one here is another scene. Again, very subtle camera movement. Uh, in this case here, the, the, the keyer that didn't key properly the, the green screen in the background. Um, but again, for the cameraman as an as a, as a, as a understanding of uh, where the whole scene is located and for, for the lightning guy to understand uh, what's happening in the context, uh, that was actually enough. And here I actually have uh, a bit more, so you can see here the real green screen, green, green screen, screen, which what the the crew would have been um, exposed to if they didn't had the, the the live composition. On the left hand side, we have the final final composition uh, from the VFX. On the right hand side, we have the the one from the original one. Um, obviously, I didn't get really the coloring that well. But again, um, from, a, from a perspective point of view, it is quite, it's quite okay. And the last scene here, um, this is actually a blue screen shot here again. The gear uh, was, was super. There were not, uh, this was not everywhere. It was, it was actually a blue screen in the background, so not everything could be keyed. Um, the lightning here, it's a And here the scene again with the, the final one on the left hand side and uh, the original one on the right hand side. So, lessons learned. Um, I will structure lesson learned lessons in, in three parts. Uh, what was the impact of the real time background plate? Uh, how does Blender compare? And where do we go from here? Now, the director and the cameraman, they were very happy about, about this, this, uh, this setup because they said this was it really saved their lives on the, on the, on the, on the set. Uh, they understood what was going on. They could actually give the uh, actors decent directions. Uh, at the end, the director said she totally trusted the image I produced here, uh, which is is nice to hear, but then again, it also puts some pressure on, because uh, if you do something wrong with the lighting of the background, you might have uh, you might cause troubles later on in the post production because your uh, front uh, plate is is, uh, is wrongly lit. So uh, what I uh, learned here was it would actually make sense in such a, such a setup to actually take a lot of care in the, in the front uh, to create really high quality background plates uh, already lit up. Uh, according to uh, the standards you would uh, kind of expect uh, in the in the final in the final post production, so and in, if you if you do that anyway, it actually makes sense uh, to do it beforehand because then uh, you you actually have a cool cool or a good reference at the beginning. Uh, now I can't really say that the lightning uh, was uh, was benefiting here because this because of this special setup. We had uh, the whole movie shown uh, shot in a, in a real location, so the guys actually they wrote down all the settings on the camera and the lightning, and they just reproduced in the, in the studio, so they cheated a little bit here. Um, but I think if you do it properly, uh, uh, it, it can be very helpful. And 
just to show it for myself, I, I got the final uh, model from the VFX guys and tried to um, I put it into Eevee and render in Eevee. Um, unfortunately, it is shown here uh, very badly. <laughs> yeah. this, this projector is not capable of uh, showing it properly. Um, it looked very convincing, um, or it looks very convincing. Um, and if you ask, can it actually play in real time? Um, yes, almost, 25 frames. Um, so you can actually do quite some, some decent uh, lightning scenes in real time, but you need a very beefy machine for that. Now, how does Blender compare to game engines which are usually used in this? Because my colleagues, they wanted to use uh, Unity for it, and also the, the for the other, for the other uh, movie, uh, they actually used Unity. And so I only can compare these two, these two game engines or these two tools. Now, both of these tools, neither Blender nor Unity, are actually made for this kind of task. Um, so um, how did they compare? And obviously, there is uh, one important thing in terms of speed, Unity, if you set up properly your scene, it's obviously faster than uh, Eevee, but you can take care of that uh, with a careful setup of Eevee. Now, in terms of real-time editing and keeping the values, I have to explain a little bit. Uh, in Unity, you have these two modes when you're in an editor. You're in an edit, edit mode and in run, in run mode. But if you're in edit mode, if you're streaming information to the, the game engine, nothing moves. It's only moving uh, when it's in run mode. But in only in run mode, you can make fine adjustment to the camera position, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but as soon as you stop from the edit mode, uh, from the run mode into edit mode, you lose all these settings. So it, it's really a painful thing, uh, and you would have to remember all the changes you made in the run mode, and it, it's just awful. So here I have to say, Blender definitely beats Unity because there is no difference between that. I didn't have to have a switch between, and I actually could see. Um, uh, see in real time in a different uh, viewport what I was doing. Then the, the view crop part of the model, I mean, it sounds like a very simple thing, but it's actually crucial if you can uh, see what's happening inside of a scan. This is something you probably cannot, cannot do in Unity, but maybe somebody here could enlighten me on that. Uh, then full screen window without border, not doable uh, in Unity. In Blender, you can do that. And um, set different render modes uh, in different viewports. You certainly can do it in Blender. I'm not sure if you can do it in Unity, though. But it's very useful because uh, if you have a high quality render, which you want to use for your background plate, uh, you only need a, a low quality render for seeing what's happening in your screen. And uh, you want to have all the oomph of the graphics card on the rendering. So where can we get from here? Uh, let's have a quick look at the, the whole uh, path here again. So in case of you have a modeling and a background rendering already in Blender, it's obviously a no-brainer to do a virtual production in Blender as well. And in terms of the, the data flow, um, obviously uh, the color key is very expensive and the tracking system is very expensive. Uh, what can we do about that? Because this is something that would keep away people of using it uh, that are in the field. Um, I have here a couple of ideas. Uh, one thing is um, you actually capture the camera into the computer and then use a color key shader. I also already have I already have a shader that is doing that, so I uh, that can do in real time uh, color keying. Uh, what you then need to do is you have to send uh, the Blender uh, result to uh, this keyer. Uh, that's something you can do with Siphon or Spout. Unfortunately, it's not working on Linux. Um, and this is a plugin I actually also wrote, so you can actually already do that. Uh, in terms of tracking system, um, I think I have a solution that might be much, much cheaper than a normal tracking system that could actually potentially work in, in more circumstances than the tracking system, but I have to make some more tests. Um, so if you want to stay in contact with me, I certainly can provide you uh, with, with the details uh, once I have conclusive information about it. But what I can promise, if it's going to work, it's certainly going to be open source. And last but not least, uh, there is another possibility. Uh, instead of sending uh, and composing the whole thing, 
You could send it to Spark and then send it to a projector. And that means you could, instead of working with green screen, you could actually project uh, the background into your background. This is actually already done. Uh, and you might have seen here on this video uh, at the beginning, uh, this is Spark. And you see here, you have to look at the background of the, of the car. Actually, the background adapts to the, the point of view of the camera. So you can, you can do this with Blender as well now. Um, so if you send, send the background texture to Spark, and Spark is, is, is taking care of all the projection for the background, you could, uh, could do something easily. And if you had a, a nice LED uh, screen like the ones we have upstairs, uh, then you would have a perfect background. Um, there is actually a nice video that shows this, how, it, how it's being done with Unity, uh, with Unreal. Um, but I would say you can easily do that with uh, Blender EV as well. Here are some of the links uh, for the AdOSC and the Spout um, and Siphon. Now, they don't, they're, not, they're both not really perfect yet. Um, if you uh, are familiar with uh, timer and cues for AdOSC or for render to texture uh, for Spout, I would be very Glad if you would uh, contact me because I think there can be s can be done some improvements, especially on the spout side, uh, where the, the rendering performance for render to texture uh, could be a bit improved. Because I need to have the setting of a view active viewport uh, to pass it on to the render to texture, and that means I render actually the same scene twice, uh, which is not necessary. And yes, and that's about it. Now I'm open for questions. Are there any questions? So Nick? Yeah. So <coughs> you mentioned Unity. There, there, is, there are like two systems possibly for rendering based on Unity. Could you address that? Like could, could be. It's yeah. the background based. So they can take the background and key to Unity. Maybe. Uh, sorry, yeah. <coughs> so, yeah, so there, there are, I don't remember the names, it's Googleable, but. Um, the systems based on Unity that do exactly that. Yes. Um, uh, in terms of background, especially, so they key in Unity, they track in Unity, and all stay without one system. But um, what would be the advantage of this? Uh, because I c if you've got a closed system that's made for performance, uh, in terms of like, I, I don't know if that's uh, jittering, if that comes from uh, latency on the uh, mockup or that comes from the tracking. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so so that you're always going to have that, I think. Yes. Uh, well, how is the OSC you can, you for can, latency? You can, you can improve on it. Yeah. You c instead of having, instead of sending uh, infrared, you could actually have active markers, so you're not flushing the whole, whole, yeah. uh, the whole stage uh, with with infrared, and you don't have these all these these, these uh, markers that yeah. pop up that uh, are actually nothing. Yeah, so that's that's that actually that's the second question because th those systems operate on uh, HTC Vive trackers which are active uh, infrared. And also they tend to use LED lighting, which is like infrared neutral. So I'm just thinking uh, HTC Vive tracker with like two base stations. I think you can go up to 16 now. Yes. Uh, that, would be, that would make it cheaper. That would certainly make it cheaper. I mean, we used uh, the large volume capture because we had it. And yeah, because it was, it, was that, yeah. it was more convenient because you could actually hook it up into the periphery of the screen, while with HTC trackers you would have them inside the stage, yeah. and then probably rearrange them all the time if you change the light fixtures and so on, and the reflectors and whatever. But then you need the uh, the actual active uh, IR illumination and the retro reflection from the trackers. Uh, the trackers get occluded sometimes. Yes. You know, everything gets a bit. But occlusion can happen with HTC Vive as well. True. You can put two on, and then you can safe ish. Well, uh, we you we had we had, we had 25 cameras, and we still had. We still have uh, occlusions, so right. so you might you might have this trouble with HTC Vive as well. Uh, but your your points are very valid. Um, now I just wanted to make myself for myself a proof of concept that I actually, I actually can use EV, and uh, and I think if you are in a in a production pipeline where you use Blender anyway, uh, that actually could make sense. Obviously, depending on the the kind of setup, the kind of, kind of uh, model you have in the background. If it's obviously very uh, computational heavy to render, then you would probably have to switch over to a, um, a game engine that could render it faster. But then again, 
it doesn't have to be real time, it doesn't have to be perfect because it's really only used as a reference. But the system I mentioned actually uses a secret. So if you don't use the real screen, it just gets a monitor on the screen and yes. and then, and then shoot with the background generator to the yes. Some more questions? Okay then, I'll wrap it up. Thanks very much for being here.